One minute. So, we are trying to uh, try some different uh, time slots. See, uh, see what works out best for our viewers at home. I feel like yesterday when we did this, we had people from all around the world. Yeah, we did. That was cool. Super cool. Yeah. Uh, I wonder um, if this a uh, couple hours later should be mostly the same. Same people can can sign on. I think maybe tomorrow we'll do it again and and try a little a little later in the day as well yeah. this is i think it's daytime for pretty much everybody it just depends on which day i mean down in australia now it's very early but not as early as yesterday anyway i'm oddly more tired today two hours later in the day than i was yesterday so mm. I don't know. Maybe it's the beginning of that afternoon fatigue mm -hmm. perhaps well while people trickle in i figure we um maybe we hop into one of the questions that we got uh, on facebook leading up to this um i think i can post it into a comment and then uh, and then share it on the screen. Hmm. Oh, but it's a little too long. Okay. Youthful. Just the Black. gist of it would be fine, I suppose. Okay, here we go. Let's send that to a comment. Whoa. Ooh. <laughs> Your alarm. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Let's try that again. Ah, there we go. Okay, sure. Ah, I see it. Okay, so I'd love any advice about helping a senior dog cope with unwanted puppy play assist insistence and how to help puppy know to be calmer and gentler around the senior dog compared to their more youthful play. It's a very good question, one which I'm sure a lot of people face because you know a lot of people do get a new puppy before their senior dog has has moved along you know, from this earth. And, you know, it's it's fine. In a lot of cases, the puppy will bring new life to a senior dog, um, and that can be really fun. Um, but even under the best of circumstances, it does need to be managed. And, you know, and there are some circumstances where the senior dog is just not into it, and you may have to really protect their, their interests and their desires. I mean, they, in, in my view, they take precedent always. The senior has earned the right to have a little more freedom or a lot more freedom and all the loving and respect and um, you know not need not really be stressed out in their in their sunset years after so many years of friendship and service. So the puppy is the newbie, the new kid on the block and has to um, learn the rules and one of the rules should absolutely be respect your elders, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, some senior dogs are equipped for that. Um, hello from the from the office. Hi, office. Who had done our office? I think Jess sure is. That's uh, Jess or Cassie. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> Jess signing on from the other the other room. Okay. Um, so, um, some some senior dogs can handle that themselves. I mean, when you say senior, it, you know, it, it could be a, a seven year old dog, it could be a fourteen year old dog, or somewhere in between. And you know, the younger the senior, the more likely they might either get peppy from this newcomer and or be able to just you know get that whippersnapper into shape. Um, if your dog is older, you know, elderly or feeble or smaller than the new newcomer or will be smaller than the newcomer when they grow up, um, you may really need to do the protecting and the rule setting and boundary setting yourself. So um, you know, allow a little bit of interaction, but I would well, regular interaction, but definitely monitored. Uh, puppy should be on leash. Puppy should be, you know, with a harness maybe, or behind a pen. Um, the old older dog should have free time. Obviously your puppy's gonna need some confinement and or, you know, whether or tethering or something um, a lot of the time when they come. And that's a great time for your old dog to have freedom to do, you know, whatever they want and be with you. Do make time for your senior dogs uh, independently from the puppy. Uh, make sure that they don't get pushed aside just because they're easier. But um, you know, you don't, you're not you're not here to help the senior dog cope with unwanted puppy play. You're here to teach the puppy to leave the dog alone. Basically, um, that's the bottom line. Um, coping. You can do classical conditioning so they learn to like each other better, and you can definitely do management work and and, and actual training work where they learn to settle and have like um, simultaneous chew time together. We do that in my house. Everybody has chew time and we do it in groups, um, you know, so um, you know, not always, but most of the time, chew time is in the evenings. I'm watching some Netflix 
or reading something online and it's my time to like be in my head and everyone's already had their exercise and their meals and their training and now they can hang out but but they gotta settle and you know we get some big dogs and some little dogs we get some older dogs and well i don't have any ancient dogs right now um i did you know mad missy couple for a couple of years and prior to that but um you know they they learn settle in your spot and your spot can be an actual cot bed it can be a soft bed it can be on the couch next to you um, you let the senior dogs pick their spot first, or if they already have an existing spot, don't let the newcomer push them aside into a new, into, you know, out of their out of their favorite place, and um, focus on it. Which means that it's not relaxing for you at first. You know, it may require some training, and it will definitely require some management. Right? A puppy's not going to just settle down. I mean, even if there isn't an older dog there, you know, not necessarily, um, not without a little bit of redirection and, re and repetition. What a really fancy, fun chew toy. Um, I have seems a like, um, favorite. Hmm? Seems like maybe early on, an un unspoken part that maybe we should speak for the uh, novices out there is that uh, if the puppy, the puppy needs to spend a lot of time in the crate, right? And so, you know, even, even, even without a multi-dog household, the puppy needs to spend a lot of time in their crate getting the potty training and the chew toy training. And so that right there should give the adult dog a lot of time to be away from the puppy yes. where you also don't have to supervise it. And, you know, and or tethered, you know, I just got a new leash um, for my youngest Eve, who's the star of the essential puppy training course. She's um, almost six months old and she's, you know, a young, a tween, I like to call them. And I got this nice leash that just loops around my, you know, my, I can over my shoulder, over my body or around my waist in the house. It's a light leash that, you know, when she's extra rambunctious, which sometimes happens right after dinner, um, and you know, the big dogs actually handle it pretty well, but Villa, my other little dog who's older than her doesn't like it. And you know, Villa was there first. Villa doesn't have to deal with being mauled by Eve in the evenings. So I, you know, I loop this around me while I'm making dinner and Eve follows me around the kitchen, which, you know, and, and, and Eve and, and Villa follows me around the kitchen because she's loose, but stays away from Eve unless she wants to get there and interact with her. So there's a lot of ways you can do this, but, but the question is really when you are having them interact, how are you doing it? Which is why the tethering does come into play. They can, Eve, Eve will come in gangbusters. And I find if I just put her on the leash with me for sometimes as, as little as three minutes, if I take her off at that point, like the, the excitement has gone down, the novelty has gone down and then I can just unclip her and they just interact normally. So um, definitely, yes, your dog, your older dog will get more free time than the puppy and, and have some downtime. But for, as for, unwanted play insistence, it's it's your job to teach the puppy. Um, we don't do that by redirecting them and or just thwarting that um, as much as possible and um, teaching appropriate interactions, which is settling and chewing together or going on a nice little walk together or just coexisting in the same place. Your older dog will more likely engage with the puppy if the puppy is in the pain in their butt right away. You know, they may, if the puppy's just kind of neutral and being there, your older dog might decide to initiate play, but if mm -hmm. they're already being always being bombarded, they won't. So that's that's how I yeah. would handle that. Hearing you talk about Eve mauling uh, Villa, I feel like it's a perfect segue into uh, me pointing out that we actually have some really great footage of that. Of that. And that's the <laughs> central puppy training course, right? I mean, we have the footage of her mauling her, but also the footage of you uh, managing that play. And you know, teaching Eve the puppy, the over rambunctious, over insistent puppy, to play in a more appropriate way, and you can see how that play session kind of evolves. Where after a few redirections and corrections, they start playing in a way that looks a lot more, less, a lot less like mauling. You know? <laughs> yeah. So we should clarify. Obviously, we're using the term mauling loosely, um, right, and then right. we, we can get some more reciprocal play. And the more I found, the more that I've tethered. And this is that was months ago, right? And Eve is still doing that occasionally to, to to Villa, which points out something else, which is, you know, puppy training is ongoing for at least for the first year. Training is ongoing, hopefully for the lifetime of the dog, just because it's fun and interactive for both of you. But hardcore, like you know, setting up your puppy for success as a lifelong companion, you know, management training um, thoughtfully for the first year is is a thing you know I, I managed Eve in that session that you're talking about on the course and it got better but it didn't get permanently better we have to keep practicing it as she goes through different developmental deadlines as well and, and, and matures so um, you know it, it is something that continues so what I what I find now is that we get reciprocal play 
um, much faster, which is when you, you, they're, they're changing. Now she's um, often flipping over on her own and you kicking your legs up and letting oh, Villa oh. get her. Um, whereas before that only happened if, if Villa literally like caught her in the air, leaving out her and knocked her over. And you know, I don't, you, you have to remember also what's happening when they're interacting is classical conditioning. I don't want Villa to hate Eve. Mm-hmm. You know, I want them to be friends. And you know, if, if that's a, a constant annoyance that could escalate or, you know, or become a, a bad relationship. So um, it's, it's puppy management. You're up on your feet a lot, you know, during these, during these early days. And um, ooh, we have our, our first live question of this session. Oh, yeah, uh, this, one's, this is long. I wonder what will happen if I try to show it. I don't uh, know. We'll see. Um, you can basically, it. not coming when called. Uh, this is a, a dog, Shy the name uh will be six months on saturday so getting on to be a, you know an adolescent Queen. Mm-hmm. um they Me uh too. go to training classes weekly and uh okay so we were in germany recently at my mother-in-law's and he escaped when the mother-in-law opened the front door we were not there and she decided to take him out of his den he would not come back when uh, what? he would not come back when she when called him, him. since mm-hmm. then he does not come back when I call him. How can I ensure that when I call Shy that he comes, that he does not bolt out the door when it is opened? Uh, writing now from Switzerland. So basically, come, uh, reliable come when called and uh, and not bolting out the front door with the six months. Yes. Old. Um, good question. Very normal circumstance. Uh, this might be more of a correlation than causation. Uh, I understand that your your mother-in-law let, let the puppy out and, you know, right when they're a tween, right when they're beginning to become an adolescent, really. And, you know, and Shai realized, woo, sweet freedom. I don't have to come and call after all. Woohoo. You know, and, you know, that may have been a one, you know, a, a, an instantaneous learning moment, one trial learning, but also... And more likely, this would have happened anyway at some point. But because it's more that's fun to blame it on the mother-in-law, they right? They boundaries, they get distracted, they make poor choices, just like human teenagers. <laughs> it is, it is. It certainly didn't help because, you know, it's a lack of management. But this will happen. This will happen. I And, it, and you know, adolescence is, you know, depending on breed, is a 6 to 12 to 18 month process um you know between your breed and and individual personalities so you have a period where you still can't rest a lot of people will pat themselves on the back after doing something like this puppy course and think look at my puppy they're awesome they come and called every time they never misbehave you know this and that and then adolescence hits and you know you you have some hiccups um rest assured you have a foundation and you have a tool for communication, your training, that will help you through this. But, you know, it's not, it's not, puppy training isn't a, a free pass for the rest of their lives. Uh, in adolescence, a lot of people, after patting themselves on the back for good puppy training, then begin to ease up on all the boundaries and rules and practice that they were doing. And it's the absolute worst time to, to do that. You know, they're just about to get naughty. Um, not intentionally, but, you know, naturally naughty. And um, I have... Um, MJ, one of my my Malinois, and she is 15 or 16 months right now. And we had our first, you know, kind of, oh, shit moment um, just like a week ago. I, she'd been recalling beautifully her entire life. And I obviously know how to train that and manage that pretty well. But we're in our own place to play, you know, at a fenced area, but a large fenced area where, you know, there are still some rules and boundaries. And she messed up and she blew me off big time and um you know you thank goodness uh, i i know that this can happen and i and we are in a safe place it wasn't at a you know a, a, a public park or something i would have managed her better even with her good track record in, in an outdoor out of our, our, own, our own neighborhood kind of place but um she still blew me off royally and in a way that could have potentially become dangerous we'll get into the details other than farm animals dog on the other side of a fence horses um and uh, she just it was astonishing you know how much she was like whatever um out of the blue so it happens um what what you need to do is probably dial back just when just when you're going to pat yourself on the back is the time actually to dial back and and maybe double down on your practice and definitely continue your management um after mj's epic 
um, adventure, we have gone back to a long line even on the property so that I can manage those moments better. I don't, I don't have to hold the long line, but that way when she's running amok and evading me, how dare she? I, even when I had her favorite toy, um, well, second favorite toy, I guess, because the favorite toy worked, but I had to go get it. Um, you know, you can step on a line, you can, you have a little bit more, more, um, control. And then we also went back to the scene of the crime immediately after, um, after I calmed down, I didn't get angry with her, but internally I was a little frustrated. Um, when I finally caught her and put her away and thought, well, let's think this through, what do I need to do? And then you go back to training. And we went back to the scene of the crime and I was prepared with her favorite toys, with my line, with a setup, and, and then we practiced and we are still practicing. Oh, sorry, that had to be about 10 days ago, at least, I think. And um, maybe a little more. And we go every day to that same spot and to different spots where I could see similar problems happening. So recall practice, double down, high value items, don't overuse your recall, practice with a line, set your puppy up for success about 85% of the time, let them make some mistakes, um, but manage those mistakes so they can't practice the, the behavior of leaving. Um, because once they realize that they're faster than you and you actually cannot catch them, you're kind of screwed. So um, you need them to know that, you know, um, you need them to want to come. You need them to want to come, which doesn't mean drilling a thousand times a day. It just means, you know, I say I practice every day. I do, but, but kind of like one off or two off. I don't do repetitions every day. I just make sure every day they go to that spot and have a really good fun party for her coming to me or not focusing on the dog on the other side. Um, uh, interestingly, part of the reason this has happened, I believe, is because not only is she a 15 or 16 month old uh, adolescent, yeah, older adolescent, high energy breed, but on the other side of the fence, their puppy is now exactly <laughs> in that same zone. He's about uh, nine or 10 months old and he's, you know, he's full of testosterone and exuberance and that changes the energy and the environment has caused all of my dogs to be a little bit more focused on that area where they prior to this been completely neutral. So it happens. Yeah. Uh, take a step back and train, 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 manage, manage, manage. Right. It's such, I feel like uh, recall coming on called such an important skill. I think we we have at least a dozen, probably a few more videos on recalls in the essential puppy training course at various stages, you know, starting when, you know, stage one, puppies new at home, um, and you're just going for, you know, very simple lured one step recalls, uh, all the way to stage five, where we're, you know, trying to do a 60 foot recall by distractions, you know, high value distractions and stuff like that to really proof the skill. And um, I feel like the the common threads between all of them were really always reward a recall, even if, mm -hmm. you know, it didn't come as promptly as you wanted, never fall into that common mistake uh, owners make where the recall didn't happen when they wanted it to. Eventually it does happen, but you're so frustrated, you don't reward your dog. Maybe you even, you know, give them a growly face. Uh, that's that's not going to help the next recall. So you want to avoid that. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. great advice. Mm -hmm um yep 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 all of that all of the above um let's see we have jacqueline from england here now and someone from australia we've got some hi and uh yeah sarah from australia has a very common i think issue and question she's wondering she's got an 11 week old mini schnauzer and she wants to get ready for being able to uh leave this dog more in the coming weeks as she returns to work sounds like her husband's working from home but they want her to be able to you know uh, be able to, I think, spend more time in confinement unsupervised. Um, you know, with the hus husband from at home, it seems like potentially the dog could still be doing a lot of time in the crate with regular trips to the potty. But I think, you know, a lot of people um, who might have both people away from home might need to be, uh, you know, moving into the, the long-term confinement setup. And I, I wonder if that's maybe what Sarah's Wondering yeah, about. it sounds like Sarah wants um, to know if she can move, you know, in a few weeks time to the pen versus the crate when no one's going to be home. And um, it, it depends. I'm still a little confused, Sarah, as to whether it, it, you work outside of the home, but your husband works from home, which means after you go back to work, he'll still be able to do some potty breaks and management. Because 
you know, um, okay, yes, that's it. She says, yes, that's it. Okay, well, that's good. If you have somebody still home, I mean, I'm sure he has to work and he can't be doing five minute intervals, but you can, I would alternate. I would use the crate some of the time and, and, the, and the pen some of the time. And yes, I keep the, at 11 weeks old, your puppy will absolutely pee in their pen um, if you keep them there too long. And by too long, it can be 10, 15 minutes at this age if they're active. You know, if they're running around and playing in that Zoom kind of stage, you know, they can pee in a heartbeat. So you either need to do a long-term confinement with an indoor toilet, which if you have somebody home, that is not my number one recommendation. Um, I would rather, yes, that you do five-minute increments and then um, either, you know, you can probably get away with 10-minute increments um, and, and then potty the puppy or, or create the puppy at that point so that they're either having an opportunity to eliminate if they've been active or to hold it in a, in a place where they're more likely to hold it for a little while. Um, but it's great that you're thinking of this proactively. You know, right now both of you are there to, have to work on this and eventually your husband's gonna have to do it on his own. And he, as, as I said, he'll need to work. He can't do it nonstop. Um, if your puppy's 11 weeks now and you say a couple weeks, I mean, let's say your puppy's 13, 14 weeks, they're still gonna need, to, um, I would say a couple hours at a time intervals sleeping in their crate and then maybe after a potty break you know you can get to, to the point where the puppy is at 13 14 weeks um crated for two hours pottied and then pen in the pen for 20 30 minutes that would be a realistic goal at that age um and you do have a long-term confinement pen set up um and when i say long-term confinement that um i mean with a, a toilet, I think you, I think you understand that. But for everybody's benefit, um, there's an X. There's there's the crate. There's the X pen. Can't do this thing with the opposites. X pen and the in the indoor toilet would be what we call the long term confinement. It's an X pen with a toilet inside, um, an, an appropriate place to to urinate if and defecate if necessary, um, because they need to be left longer than you you know than they can hold it. So um, again, if somebody is able to let the puppy out for a quick potty, even if they go right back into their pen, it's, it's, pref it's my preferred method because it just eliminates confusion as to, do you ever go inside the house? Do you ever go inside your pen? Never. Um, but if you need it and you have a separate doggy toilet with the appropriate substrate, as we discuss and demonstrate in the course, um, you can, you can do that too. Yeah, it's a, Another great question that I feel like uh, is covered so well in the course where we talk about, you know, we, when we were trying to introduce the pen as being a new form of confinement and we ran into some trouble with, uh, you know, the uh, the house soiling becomes such an issue inside of a pen, outside of a crate. I like this one from Leslie. Um, so if your dog is on a line, you call her, she decides not to come, do you pull her towards you or just repeat the command? That's a good question. Um, I try not to pull her towards me unless I absolutely have to, but what I will do is step on the line. You know, I like to tie a little knot at the end or put a, literally put a stick or something heavy at the other end so that there's like, I can, I can step on it without it slipping throughout my, through my legs, my feet, under my foot or something. And I'll just step on it so that she can't continue doing what she's doing. So in this case, she was running the fence, bar having a barking match with this lab puppy or adolescent lab with a horse in between them. So it was my dog, a fence line, a horse paddock, and then the other dog. And it was just, I saw potential for chaos there. And I did not like that. So, um, you know, if, with a line on, I can, I can stop her. Without a line, she can just evade me to no end. So um, I generally only use 10 to 15 feet, but you could do, because I don't like it to get long and entangled, but you could use longer. And I like BioThing because it, it doesn't tangle and get all icky. Um, so generally just stop the behavior and then wait them out or try to entice them in other ways. Once they're, the action is thwarted though, the fun that they're having is thwarted, usually you have a moment to get their attention and then you can say, yes, yay, you looked at me, good puppy. Don't ask for the whole shebang. If you get, if you get, and then we go, wait, what? What's happening? And look at you, throw a party. And then just you have to recall them. I mean, reward them for coming if they do. Or, or I might run backwards. If I think if I think I've really got her, I might step off the line and run away from that that thing. Um, pulling is the last resort because it's not them making the choice. It's not them really learning in the same way. And it can actually increase the um, 
excitement with the opposition reflex and, and, you know, and getting them to focus out there a little bit more, but a very good question. Um, yeah. And if you don't have anything on you, then you just try you know, everything. You try to be as fun as if you don't have a leash on them or you don't have it, you just, you run the other direction, you fall down and act silly, you get a favorite toy and play with it. You squeak, you know, you know, you do what you can to get their attention. A lot of times, um, opening the car door will do it if you're on your own property, you will know, hop into the car, but you know, you avoid the, the problem. You, your, your goal at that point is to get them safe and to get them back to you so you can then address it. It's not to teach in that moment. You, the, the horse is out of the barn, literally in this case, but um, although to, to be fair, she wasn't bothering the horse and the horse wasn't bothered by her. Um, once the horse is out of the barn, you're, you know, you're not training, you're managing and trying to get this, this situation back under control. Okay, if there's one above that. Can we go? How do you move this, Jamie? There's one that. Oh, here we go. You can scroll. Uh, but I wanted to do yes, this one. Okay, I wanted to do this one um, that we someone someone sent us before, uh, because it is a, a puppy question. I want to prioritize the actual puppy questions first. Um, and uh, so yeah, I have a question about introducing an eight-week-old puppy into a three-dog home with uh, two neutered males, and. Uh, one spayed female, and they're wondering, does the sex of the new dog present any issues? Um, I think they're thinking, for example, will the current male be more prone to urine marking if the new puppy is male, or is same-sex aggression likely? Um, good question. Uh, good question. Nice to be thinking of these things before you get your puppy. Um, if everyone's going to be spayed and neutered, it's not going to be as big of a deal. So if this new puppy is also going to be um, altered at an appropriate age, not such a big deal. It's and It'll make it a little easier that everyone is. Um, in general, broadly speaking, in uh, um, altered males, neutered males, are the easiest to have to house together and the easiest to train. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, if that, you speak, you know, if that's, if that's helpful and because you already have a multi-dog household that might be the way you want to go um they'll be more easily accepted they're going to be less likely to, to be you know to be weird um your neutered male will probably not have such problems with an intact male up to a certain age um yeah so a dog that's a, a, a male dog especially that's that's altered, this is more Ian's territory than mine, but I can speak to it a little bit, is um, is going to smell neutral, hence the word neutered, to other dogs. So they just kind of come off as a female that's not in season a uh, little bit. Um, but the dog, the, the dog itself, all its uh, secondary, se well, primary sex, uh, sexual characteristics were already developed. So a neutered dog feels male, but doesn't feel super male. It doesn't have all the edges of the testosterone, you know, that they get in their secondary sec sexual characteristics if they're neutered early or when they're neutered, that just kind of tapers off a little bit. Um, but they, the dog that comes in, if it's not neutered, it's going to smell like a, an intact male. When it's an adolescent, it's going to get his butt kicked no matter what. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing up to a point. Um, females are harder to, to deal with, with that female dogs. Um, tend not to get along as well as easily um, and as high of numbers if regardless of whether they're spayed or not. So it, my answer is get a male and then if even whether or not you're planning to neuter, I suppose, the new puppy. All right. Here's a question um, from South Africa. We are getting a blue Staffordshire Bull Terrier puppy in a few weeks from now. They have never had a pet before. This is all a new experience. I just want some advice on training the dog to be gentle and careful with a five-year-old girl and a newborn on the way. So kids and babies and puppies. Okay, I love, yeah, I love, I love that breed so much. I love those staffy bulls. They're so cute. Um, they're not known for being delicate flowers though. So that is something you're gonna have to work on. Um, again, still management, you know, uh, Puppies and babies, you know, neither of them have that much sense or impulse control. So uh, you're going to have to still be in charge of all of that. Uh, we cover some of this in the course, I would say, as well. Teaching your puppy how to play gently. You know, you would, you, it's, it's kind of like bite inhibition, but body inhibition, right? It's so, it's like, okay, um, let things escalate to a point and then say, no, 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 we're going to take it down again. And just, you know, nipping that in the bud. Don't, don't let things get um, overly 
don't let your puppy get overly aroused or let things get out of control in, for the most part. Um, however, you do need to give them appropriate outlets at times, right? So um, you don't want to tell this puppy it can never bang around and get body slammed and, and tug, but teach your puppy to tug. This is while we play. This is the on. This is the go crazy in the settle game, right, Jamie? We have some mm -hmm. fun in there. Oh, yeah. Um, Got some jazz up and some settle down. Yeah, so you can you can you can do that, um, but it ain't gonna be perfect for a year or two. And we also have a video of introducing Eve to children, which um, even if you don't have children in your household, that's essential because the kids are out there. And uh, if your puppy doesn't meet meet kids as a puppy, then when they finally do meet kids and the kids do the weird things that kids do, it's gonna it's gonna spook them. So we've got we got one good video with uh, Eve meeting a couple of neighbor kids. And uh, and lots of videos about impulse control, bite inhibition, and um, and getting excited, and then settling down, and having that kind of ability to modulate energy. Yeah, but you can't expect miracles. It will still be definitely a lot of management. Um, I mean, staffy bulls are small, but they're strong, and kids are small, so it's not going to feel like a small dog, you know. And uh, just you know, settle times, management, training. Yeah, I mean, a huge, I'd say a huge part of it, too, especially with a five year old is, you know, the the kind of skill level of a five year old can be can range wildly and that it's going to be equally about training the five year old girl as it is about training the puppy. And that, you know, the girl has to learn how to control her body when she doesn't want to get the puppy energized, you know, because a lot of kids their instinct if a puppy's jumping up and licking them the face is to, you know, giggle and, you know, scream and do these movements that could be like, are the ideal way to kind of lure a puppy to get excited. So, you know, they've got to learn to be still, um, you know, stop moving, don't make squeaky noises. Uh, and in order to learn that, it's going to be right. A lot of supervision. You're not going to want to leave uh, a five-year-old with a puppy uh, for a long, long time. Yeah. No, and Jamie, as a parent of young children, you uh, you know you people always say teach your children to respect dogs, and of course that's a lesson they should learn. But you can't expect them to fully embody that as toddlers, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's it's going to be a learning process for them as well, and some kids will take to it well, and and you'll want to supervise them the first you know the first many play sessions and get a feel for. You know, some five-year-olds are very responsible and are going to be very good at that um, and will be natural trainers. And other five-year-olds are going to be like spazzing out and making your dog crazy. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. obviously, obviously you don't have control entirely over your five-year-old. No parent does, but uh, but that's something. You want. <laughs> and, and some dog, dogs, some children will like dogs better than others, too. You know, some are going to naturally be okay with that kind of body slamming and chewing and licking and others are not going to be into it. So. Yeah. Katarina points out a, a five-year-old is not a toddler. And, and while that's true, I think there are plenty of, uh, of uh, five-year-olds who can act as silly and goofy and out of control as a... Oh, absolutely. No, no, they're not a toddler. But adult I'm males baby can act as silly as a toddler. And they, yeah, well, that's for sure. They have, they have a baby on the way too, though. So they're not out of the toddler woods yet either. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a general, broad general thing that I wanted to bring up because... Um, a five-year-old can start to learn, sure, but again, at five, I think impulse control is not great. I'm not, you know, I'm not a developmental psychologist, but um, you know, I think you have to expect children, just like puppies, developmentally, they have you know different different capabilities at a certain age, and they should absolutely you know be taught inherently to respect animals um, and such. But that doesn't mean you're not going to get a puppy slapped in the face by a kid, you know, or, or pushed over or something. Uh, so. I believe the Management. famous story from my, from my youth is um, I put on a Superman cape, climb on, climb to the top of the uh, the couch and jumped off of it onto uh, onto our family's Malamute, and um, that was a testament to the bite inhibition <laughs> training that had been received, and also a good reminder to Ian that you you can't leave a a kid unsupervised because kids do stupid things. Kids do crazy things that you couldn't plan for. You know, you couldn't like, you wouldn't tell them, okay, don't body slam or belly flop onto the Malamute from the couch. It wouldn't be necessarily one of the rules of the house. Yeah. Uh, it is a rule of the house, but you wouldn't think that you'd have to verbalize. Unspoken rule. <laughs> yeah, so many unspoken rules. Yeah. Yes. Look, yes. Um, on another note, Duca, one of our serious instructors, says hi. Duca, hello. Hi. hi Duca. I don't even see that. You, 
uh, I don't even see her there. I, I'm behind here. Oh, her, hello. Okay, here's Karen um, Bittner. Oh, go ahead. I'm just reading. I, I, I have a Mastiff out. Lab mix. He will be a year old next month, so not quite a puppy, but we're happy to uh, to to address the question. He has aggression problems of snapping at the other dogs around food. I assume that's other dogs in the household, whether it's people eating or over dog food. Uh, the dogs all have their own bowls. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's something that you're going to have to work on in in the bigger picture. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes get resource guardy and there's, there's, there's protocols for that. Um, you're, you're teetering on the edge of aggression there and without, with a large dog and with multiple dog household, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I can't really, I don't want to get too deep into advising on that in, the, in this forum because it's serious stuff, even though it's just burgeoning and, it, and you can definitely still work on this. Um, I'll say a little bit of what I said yesterday. Somebody had a similar issue, um, which is, you know, for eating, um, we have, we have boundaries, we have rules, we have uh, routines and the multi-dog household where uh, everyone has their own space to eat, whether it be their own crate, their own pen, or, um, their own cot bed. I have you know, multiple cot beds and everyone could be on their bed with their Kongs or their chew toys or their bowls if it were. And um, they need to stay on their place while they eat and while everyone else eats until released. So that can diffuse that a bit, especially if you give them plenty of uh, distance from each other. They don't all have to eat together in a group. Um, you know, it's it's hard for me to say. What 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 are these other dogs? What are they doing? Is somebody eyeballing somebody else? Is somebody just getting guardy and too big for their britches in their early at, later adolescence, where they're becoming young adult male and getting a little um, you know full of themselves? So it's definitely worth addressing and um, and managing managing first while you address it when you have time to address it. Um, but there are whole resource guarding protocols out there which. Um, which, yeah, I can't speak to in depth. No. I mean, the, the, the multiple dog issue seems so complicated where we really can't can't evaluate it without seeing it in person and seeing all the nuance. The, the ag aggression around kind of bull guarding is a little simpler, I think. And, and it's, it's a good example also of a reason we don't love feeding dogs from bulls is because then the dog is, you know, the only thing they're loving there is their bull. They're not loving you, you know. That's why... Hand feeding a dog teaches the dog to love the handler, yeah. uh, but kind of giving but it a sounds like they're guarding from the other dogs. So no matter right, what right. it is, it's a high value item being guarded, and you know you can you can break that down into 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 various exercises, um, starting with as small a piece as you can, which is maybe dogs at very far distance. Again, there's 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 really good protocols about this, and I think we have some on the Dunbar Academy, um, but um, I'm not the I, I don't know the whole I don't memorize the whole. You know the the catalog better than I do. Yeah, yeah. In the um, in the Top Dog Academy, the Behavior Problems Compendium has a resource guarding section. Um, yeah. But yeah, let's let's stick with puppies for today. And uh, there's a good one. Trying to play tug with a female four month old puppy, but I assume she's trying to say, or they're trying to say, the puppy's biting during play sessions of tug, um, or getting ready to bite, or something along those lines. Yeah, um, the way that's worded, I'm not exactly sure. It sounds like maybe the puppy is targeting your hands instead of the toy or or just randomly targeting. Um, it's a puppy, so they don't necessarily know how to best use their mouths and their bodies yet. Um, you can teach your puppy. I mean, I think tugging is a great resource, a great tool for almost, well, not, well, not every dog, because every dog loves to tug. But when they do, if they do, oh, my goodness, you've, you've got a, a great tool here. Um, Interactive play is great. I think it's it's even better than than ball playing ball with your puppy because they're they're playing with you, and you can teach them. This is a great opportunity to teach them how to use their jaws gently and how to play appropriately. We like to teach them the rules of tug of war, which are um, you do not you only tug on tug toys, right? Don't tug on my my shirt. Don't tug on my, my braid. Um, and if you do tug on something inappropriate, it's a, a removal and a timeout. You know, it could be timeout can be thirty seconds, ten seconds, just an end of play. Um, three strikes, you're out. Then the game is over for a timeout. Um, so you only you only tug on to tug toys when invited is the second rule, and then you release. Well, the, the third rule is 
you know, if you make a mistake, if you target wrong or you, or you chomp and, and switch and munch onto your hands, the game takes a break or game is over, at least temporarily. Um, and then they learn to release when, when asked. Um, it doesn't mean you never let them win and get them to come back to you. We do play tug a lot, both with Daisy in your series on YouTube um, and mm -hmm. then with Eve, they were both little tuggers. So there's a lot of practice of that. And they don't know, they don't know necessarily. They're, they're capable of learning how to target appropriately and being extraordinarily accurate. I think there's some video with me on the um, Facebook Top Dogs group, which I can I can reload or add a new one of Era, my extraordinarily fast and powerful um, working Malinois, biting on a tug toy that is this big that I'm holding and always targeting just the toy. Um, they can learn that, but you have to teach them. You know, like by saying, ouch, ow, oh, you got me. Nope, sorry, we're not playing for a minute. You know, or make presenting the toy better so they really have a big toy. And as soon as they munch towards your hand, nope, it's over. Go redirect, redirect, redirect. End the game when they hit your, your flesh or your shirt or your hair. And um, redirect to the appropriate toy. At this age, though, they're just learning the rules and also even functionally how to use their bodies. Um, also, you might be playing tug too long and getting your puppy riled up. I don't know if this is part of the problem, but if they start to get into like spun out mode, you know, you start with a little tug and they're like, rah, 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 and then eventually they're like, ah, I've got the toy and they're getting crazy. Well, you know, don't let it get that high. Another excellent reason tug is great other than teaching um, how to be careful with body, body, human body parts and how to target appropriately. It's to, and how to release something when necessary, it's to, um, Teach them to to jazz up and settle down, um, and how to how to get a little bit of arousal in there, and then how to how to take that down a notch. So um, you know, tug for ten seconds and then ask for release. Tug you know three seconds if your puppy gets really aroused, and then work up to you know minute sessions or thirty second sessions. I ask for a lot of releases, or or I let them win and then invite them to come back to me. Or switch toys and if they take the toy and run i'll get another toy and start playing with that one but we have a lot of video and tug in in the dunbar academy um and on youtube i do a ton of tug with Knox. also i think um who's a larger dog if you have well although this is only a four, four month old puppy so you shouldn't have the problem Knox, i think also was not great with tug rules jamie do you remember when we started with her she was kind of rude i think um and that's yeah. in the dunbar dog diaries so Lots of resources out there. It's a skill they have to practice and they have to learn the rules, though. All right. What about um, how do we train our dogs to get used to this loud noise such as thunderstorms and fireworks? Um, I guess it says dogs, uh, but I think this is the person who's bringing home a puppy in the near future. I think okay, it's, uh, well, a new, a new puppy owner? Okay. I think that's this is the, I think it's the person with the, the kids who's uh you know oh, okay. a okay. five year old and a newborn. Um, I mean, I think you know uh, habituation is what you want to do with a puppy. You want to get them used to everything, every noise, every sound. Every sound is a noise. Uh, smells, sights, everything that they're going to have to experience in, on the regular or even occasionally um, in their world is something that you should expose them to gently and gradually at the beginning. Uh, puppies are really, really open little sponges when they're born. They have no expectations for what's normal, what's not normal, and they're they're not, um, generally speaking, so fearful as little ones. They're not supposed to be. Some are. There's always a difference in, in pre-type and personality. But, um, you know, you, you play noises in the background. Online you can get anything now. Just put YouTube on the, in the background with firework noises quiet noises in the distance like put the computer in the other room play with the puppy feed them while you're doing noises like this um, babies crying is another big one fireworks um, buses for some reason is a really big one vacuum cleaners um, and we do have a really fun section on um, how to do this in the new essential puppy course um, including a unfortunately or fortunately a section on how to fix it if your puppy is startled by something um, because it happened either out of your control or or you didn't plan well enough right, right Jamie indeed yeah we I just actually so before we got on this live session I was uh, working on uploading the fourth stage of the course there's five stages the first three have been up for a couple weeks and I'm putting the fourth one up now but I was putting the finishing touches on what I like to call the dancing penguin segment, where we 
We accidentally startled Eve to this with this animatronic robotic dancing penguin. And until this point, Eve had been unflappable. She hadn't been scared by anything she'd seen. You know, leaf blowers and chipper shredders and, you know, heavy machinery. And we introduced a vacuums and all sorts of things. And then this little well, dancing she'd penguin. She'd even seen giant animatronics already. Because it was yeah, Halloween. Yeah. It was so Halloween. So she'd to... seen, like, werewolves that were doing this and, you know, moving yeah. with lighted, light, eyes lighting up. And nothing bothered her. But so yeah, I got this... a little too comfortable and a little too cocky there. But, um, yeah. Like yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of that segment, and I think it's going to be helpful for not just puppy owners, but I think um, some of our older dog owners, because a lot of a lot of people need help with rebuilding confidence after a, a dog has been startled. But up to that point, you know, prior to that, we do show introducing you to all of the other things without the startling. And um, yes. there's, I mean, Jamie is extraordinarily creative about this kind of stuff, so we really introduced her. Um, to some fun and interesting things and people, but um, you know, um, I would say yes. You you may call that the animatronic penguin section. I call it Jamie's favorite section, and what was what was close to my second mental breakdown um, <laughs> in the. I only had two, I think, yeah. in the making of the series. Um, the no, mental breakdowns are where the real the real benefit, the real value comes from. So I appreciate <laughs> you taking one for the team, Kelly. Uh, I mean, we did not about, be clear. We did not scare her on purpose. Um, right. but we probably got a little cocky. It shows the develop, developmentally how much they change over um, a few weeks period too. Um, so I think we're going to be winding down soon, but maybe time for one or two more little questions. This is uh, hi. We have a seven month that's regressed her potty training. She's now peeing more frequently inside, and the length of time she's able to hold it has stalled at three hours. We, we used treat to reward going outside. And then she followed up by saying, should we go back to crate training again? Yeah, at that age, you're at seven months, you are starting the wild ride of full on adolescence. Uh, I would also say, you know, whenever there, whenever you have um, a digression, digression, uh, regression, regression, regression. Um, in, in urinary stuff, especially with females, make sure there's no kind of UTI happening or any kind of infection. Um, look at frequency of urination versus and volume as well. You know, if there's a lot of frequent, not high volume peas, you may have other issues. Um, we also could have a dog if she's intact that could be getting ready to go into season, um, which would cause urine marking as well. As So are these full on pee dumps or are these little squirts or are these, you know, accidents that, you know, are happening frequently, all things to consider when you're having this kind of problem. That said, seven months is also the time that I, just like I mentioned earlier, when the humans start to go from really tightly managing their puppy to, oh, we're done, you know, and, and it's never that black and white. And even if you didn't, th don't think you did that, you might have done a little, taken a, gr a broader leap than you, should have when it comes to freedom and lack of supervision and or reinforcing potty breaks or watching the, the puppy potty outside at seven months old, they're not a puppy, but um, you know, go outside, you still need to go outside. You can't just trust, well, they've always gone potty when I take them out. So I just let her out the back door. Seven months of age, she might be getting distracted by everything out in the yard. And if you're not there to see her go, she may have played the whole time she was out there and then will come in and have to potty. So there's a lot of reasons that this could happen. Um, you know, once you've ruled out um, any kind of medical issue, I would say, yes, dial it back, take it a few steps back and go back to management and re making sure you see when your puppy goes. Um, again, my, my adolescent MJ, she's older, but she's still definitely a child in her head. Um, over her, over the adolescent period from her puppyhood has gone um, to a point where distraction will stop her from going to the bathroom outside. Uh, so I, I was dealing with that firsthand. You know, you'd think she went, I'd put her in a big pen or I'd leave her out for a while after we had a training session, assuming that of course she's going to pee because she used to pee and she knows she has to pee. And I found that uh, I had to go back to saying, here's the ball, go potty, watching her go, now we're going to play ball. Uh, and mm -hmm. then the same thing at the end, she's out by herself afterwards for a bit of a stretch and some sun. Well, I'm not bringing you back in until I see, see some, see you pay some with some pee. Get the ball again, go potty, throw it a couple times, bring her back in. So she may be getting distracted as well. 
Okay. Um, so one or two more, I'm thinking, uh, I'm going to talk about a pup that fell into a pool and how to keep him from getting scared of it. Or well, uh, a humper. A humper. <laughs> we'll do or the humper, humper then. Either way, right, I mean... So. It's a predictable problem that after my husband stops petting our almost one-year-old lab, that she will then get up and hump his leg. What's a good way to redirect her? I suggested having some kibble in his pocket pocket, and tossing it away from her. Uh, as soon as he stops giving her attention, um, she doesn't do this to me, the poster. So. Uh, so yeah, it sounds like an over-arousal issue, and I don't mean that in a sexual context. It's just, you know, they get excited. They're at that age. This is still an older adolescent, young, you know, young adult um, dog, and they maybe, I'm going to take a guess here, your husband is petting differently than you do, and I, meaning, <gasps> maybe getting really excited, and getting really excited, and pushing the puppy, and rubbing the puppy, and, you know, and Getting her all like, <gasps> and you know, spun up when you know maybe when he gets home from work or something, and um, but that's different than how you're interacting with her. So she's getting super aroused and then needs an outlet. Um, if that's the case, then you could train your husband <laughs> um, to, to interact differently. Good luck with that, um, and or you can at least. Or, well, you're going to have to treat your husband a little bit if that is the case, which is um, teach him. The kibble isn't a bad idea, but I would actually work on more calming behaviors, which is um, stopping petting sooner and taking a break, or stopping crazy time sooner, taking a break, and then crazy times like working up and then working back down, working up, working back down. Psst, throw a down in there, do a little down stay, do some sit, come sit, come sit. Get a toy. Um, redirect her to a toy. You have a tug toy ready. I would like that better probably than food because then he can interact with her in a way that is still an outlet because she's needing, she's looking for an outlet at that point. She's feeling feelings and, and you know, needs to find somewhere to put them. And uh, so, you know, settling her down and redirecting would be the key and or teaching your husband to um, either interact more calmly or um, at times or no, but you don't always want to interact calmly. You want to be able to be silly with your dog. So just take more breaks. Don't let things escalate because they just keep going up. You gotta learn to ride the wave. I can do this. Cool. Great information, doing... Kelly. Are and I done? think, um, and that is another of many topics, humping, that we have a dedicated section for in the Top Dog Academy. I think that that's going to conclude it for today. But before we go, I want to remind everyone, not only does the Top Dog Academy have the Behavior Problems Compendium where we've got sections for all these, you know, common uh, behavior problems, but it has our new Essential Puppy course, which has demo Ooh. videos, hundreds, over 100 demo videos, uh, including lots of them for the recalls and the boundary training and the bite inhibition and playing tug and all the good stuff we've been talking about today. So if you want to see it actually done, hands-on, then uh, check it out for just $20. You can join the Top Dog Academy. And uh, yeah, we offer a, a satisfaction guarantee. So if you're not totally blown away, let us know within 30 days. we happy to offer you a refund, but we are confident that you are going to be impressed because we've been hard at work for the past few months making this. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yes, thank and, you. Uh, I think we're probably going to try and do another one of these tomorrow. It might be a little more light and fun. We might uh, might rope in a special special surprise guest. We'll see. Or two. Uh, or two. Ooh, or two. Yes, I like it. Um, we will, of course, once we figure out the time, we'll post here on Facebook, so uh, so you can put it in your calendar. All right. Nice thanks party. again for watching. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Kelly. Bye, Jamie. Bye.